really are bringing is the the realities of life, the struggles of life, the difficulties of life, the hardships of life, and how we can know that we're meeting with God and God is meeting with us in these situations. Christianity is not about escapism. It's about going through the realities of life with God. And as you look, as we've been looking at these Psalms, you will see generally that through these Psalms, the circumstances which people are in don't change. It's just their heart and attitude is changed as they work through their situation with God. And so you have a final statement like this psalm where he says, but I will trust in you. Voyage from turmoil into a situation of confident trust. You see, if you're like me, you so easily want in a Christianity which is based upon being in nice circumstances. Yeah. And when I'm in nice circumstances, then it's going to be a great, I'm going to, I'm going to have a great Christian life. The reality of God's word is that we are to live for God through all the circumstances of life and draw upon him and to be strong in faith, no matter how good or how bad circumstances. And they're pretty bad for David in this psalm, and we'll come and have a look. And he works it through. You see, as we come in to introduce the psalm, that's one thing I've been very aware of in preparing is, you know, we I could coldly divide it up and say, this is this, and then that's that, this is this. But in a sense, I say carefully, I, I don't want to be irreverent here, but in a sense, the psalm's a bit messy. It's, it's, it's a man in great perplexity struggling to work through how his attitude towards other people and knowing he's got God to be in it all. So what I plan to do this morning is Psalm 55. Have it open in front of you. I want to journey through the psalm. Journey with David through the psalm. Journey with his experience. And if you're like me, having spent some time with Psalm 55 this week, you'll realise, ah, I, I'm with David. I've got some of this stuff. I've been through some of this stuff. And uh, maybe a preparation for stuff ahead. So let's get into Psalm 55. At Psalm 55. And... Uh, we want to know that the Lord is speaking to us. So Psalm 55 has said to you several times, the first statement in your ESV Bible where it says, cast your burden on the Lord, uh, that's been put in, that's not in the original, but the next statement is to the choir master with string instruments, a masculine of David. So we have David, it's to string instruments. It's not for drums and trumpets, because you don't want... This is a, this, these are hard things and you want some, dare I say, some more calming music, <laughs> some strings that, that help you through working through these things. So let's think, let's get into those first two verses and we'll see David is, is coming before God. And we just want to make that point again, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we're going through difficulties, when we're going through struggles, our first thing to do is we go to God. We get God on the scene. We get God included. And so he says, give ear to my prayer, O God. Hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. I need you, Lord. I need you to be in this situation. Attend to me. Answer me. I'm restless in my complaint. And I'm moan. And I'm moan. And he wants God. Fundamentally, he wants God in the situation. And that's good. That's healthy. That's wholesome. That's what we should be doing. When we come into the situations of life, what should we always be doing? 
particularly when there are hard situations, we should be getting, we should be praying. We should be praying. Well, let's get into some of the hard circumstances then. David is wanting God. He's wanting his mercy. He's wanting him to touch his situation uh, for good. Well, let's look at uh, verses four, verses three. Verse three to start off with. You'll see here that David is in tumult. That David is in tumult in verse three. Everything is in a great upheaval. Everything is, look at it, there's the noise of the enemy, the oppression of the wicked, the, the, the dropping trouble upon me, like, like bombs are being dropped on him, trouble bombs. And anger there, they got grudges against him. It's not nice stuff, is it? It's hard stuff. People are against in difficult circumstances, trouble. Uh, the likelihood of when this psalm is situated is it takes you back to 2 Samuel 15, 16, 17 and Absalom's rebellion. Absalom was the, uh, was the, uh, was the son of David. Absalom had taken over David's throne. Absalom had kicked David out. And others had joined with him. It's a terrible time. It's such a difficult time. And you've got people who are against David. And he's kicked out of home, really. Kicked out of all of his familiar circumstances. He's on the run. Doesn't know where it's going to end up. And you've got the likes of Shimei. Listen to this. Uh, when King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. He threw stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. And there's Shimei. And he's cursing David. He's lobbing all of this nasty aggressive stuff and so everything is is just going against david all these people are massing and absalom is son has become an enemy oh what do you make of that how is life for you sounds <laughs> real you see because life can sometimes be a little bit like this can't it in work, you can feel that everything is going wrong. You're treated badly by your boss. You've got unsympathetic uh, colleagues. Family can be like this sometimes, and you can be the only one who's for God, and all around they're dropping bombs on you, and you be will and overwhelmed, and you. Don't know what the way ahead is. Life can be like this. You can. Well, let's go to verses four and five. If that, we might say, is the tumultuous circumstances, I'm going to suggest you in verses four and five that David has got a degree of, uh, David has got a, a degree that he's suffering from uh, bad mental health, uh, some depression even here. Uh, read it. My heart is in great anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. Seems as though that, that internally in his heart he's just filled, filled with negativity, hopelessness, wondering how he's going to cope with the future. Depressive affliction on his soul. Overwhelmed. Possibly some panic attacks in here as well, dare I say. Horror overwhelms me. You ever had panic attacks? I've had them once or twice. Nasty. 
oh, overwhelmed, painful. So dare I say so far, outside overwhelmed, inside in turmoil. Turmoil. This is David. This is reality. Can I just say, Christians suffer from mental illness as well, you know. Away with this idea that Christians don't have mental illness, okay? And if you're in this church and you suffer with mental illness, you must share it because we're here to help each other, okay? Don't hide it, thinking, well, I'm spiritual, I'm supposed not to have it. You suffer from mental illness. Christians suffer from mental illness, okay? We're here to help. So here's David. Dare I say he's got mental illness and he's got pretty unpleasant circumstances. What's he to do? What's he to do? And so what do you say? What do you see? You, you see then in verses, uh, verses, uh, verses six, seven, eight, says, Oh, oh, that I had wings like a dove. Oh, if I could only just get out of this. If, you know, a dove, nothing stops a dove, does it? It just flies. And I just want to get out of this and just fly away and just be gone. And, 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 and then I'd be at rest. Yes, I'd just be far away, verse 7. I'd lodge in a wilderness. You know, I've been in a palace and I've got at all this stuff happened now i just want a wilderness just somewhere quiet just somewhere where there's going to be no disturbance and it's almost as if the silla comes in too early because it's it's sort of second well what do you think about that which is what silla means and he says i would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest ah that's just what i want just what i want it's interesting i remember it it's one of those experiences in my life, October uh, 2002, on holiday in Devon, in Zeal Monocorum, in, in this farmhouse, and I was in turmoil, and I was in, I, I, I was just, well, I had depression. I, I, and, I, and I remember this was my daily reading. I came to it, and I just remember it. And I just, just, just along me, oh, that I was out of this world. Oh, that it, I was out of this. And that's David, you see. He's real, isn't he? You know, he's not gloss, he's not glossing things over. He's just said, oh, I wish you could go and be gone. Perhaps you feel like that. Perhaps you feel like that. Perhaps you have felt like that. Perhaps one day you might feel like that in the realities of life. But David is realizing he can't get away from the reality. So he gets to prayer in verses 9 to 11. He gets to prayer. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Now we're uncomfortable with this. Aren't we? uh, let's be honest. We're uncomfortable with this language, aren't we? Yeah, we, we find it a bit harsh. Okay, uh, let, Let's just... Just see the, the following statements then. In verses 10 and 11, day and night they go round on walls and iniquity and trouble are within it, ruin in its midst, oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. Well, where's the marketplace? Where's the marketplace? If you go and visit a, a town, small town in England, uh, the towns are arranged a bit different now, but historically the marketplace is the centre. So you see, basically, you say the whole place is rotten. <laughs> the whole place is rotten with corruption, iniquity, evil. It's just bad. You feel England's a little bit like that at the moment? You feel England's a little bit like that? So how do we respond? How do we respond when you see evil progressing? The Christian... Let me, you've got to hit, but please hear me carefully here. The Christian's desire is for the removal of evil. Christians want evil gone. 
Now, there's two ways that evil go. Two ways that evil can go. They can go through repentance and forgiveness or through judgment and condemnation. Those are the two ways that evil can go. Now, David here is a basically saying, get rid of this evil, Lord, by judgment and condemnation. It says, destroy, O Lord. Divide their tongues. Now, we find this difficult. I find this difficult. Well, you, you may find it easy, but I think we do possibly find it difficult. How are we to reason that, that David can pray, we might, might say, judgment upon his enemies or judgment upon these bad situations? Well, <laughs> let me just leap forward a bit and put ourselves into our situation. When the Lord Jesus came into the world and, and start, came into this world, and then when he started his ministry, he came to Nazareth. And he, in the Nazareth, in the synagogue, we read this. No need to turn, but it's in Luke 4. Luke 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, what's significant about that? Well, the Lord is basically saying in his ministry, his ministry is a ministry of good news when he's come into the world. But if you're familiar with the fact that he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 2, he doesn't, he breaks off in the middle of the sentence. Because if you carry it on in Isaiah 61, you would read, and the day of vengeance of our God. So what's the significance of that? We are not in the day of vengeance of our God at the moment. We're in the day of the Lord's favor. So primarily, our prayers today are, Lord, remove evil through repentance and forgiveness. And so we're praying for the gospel to go forward. And as we see Islam on the march, for example, and all of its evil, we're praying, Lord, we could bring them to salvation, raise up missionaries. But I don't think we should be ashamed at times to be praying along the lines of a David. The primary focus of our prayers today is repentance and forgiveness. There will come a day of vengeance of our God in the future where it will be judgment and condemnation. In the Old Testament, well, probably it was half-half. I say that very carefully. <laughs> but, but David here, you see, brothers and sisters in Christ, we should hate evil. We should hate it. And we should long for it to be gone when we see child prostitution, drug traffic, wrecked life. Name it, drunkenness, whatever. We just want it gone. And that's David, you see here. He wants it gone. It's his heart. It challenges brothers and sisters. Do we, are we are have we become too content with the evil that's around us? Okay, uh, uh, that's wanting to understand why David is praying in that way. Let's go on to verse 12. And David jumps back. Uh, what's the problem that David's going through? Verse 3, tumult, his circumstances are just tumultuous. Verse 4 and 5, there's a degree of mental illness. And then I, he's got this other problem. Verses, verse 12, we pick it up. Betrayal. Treachery. For it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who 
deals insolent with me. Then I could hide from it. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We enjoyed great things together. Now, who's this? I suggest go and read in the scriptures. You'll find him. This is Ahithophel. And Ahithophel, he was David's counselor. He was David's advisor. And David relied upon him. And he shifted over to Absalom. Shifted. Gave up on David. Left him, and he went to advise Absalom. Treachery, betrayal, only sticking with somebody when it's all going well. When it all turns badly, you go to the go to the enemy. David here, he's cut up about it. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the plot. Treachery. Been through it? Broken marriage. A husband who's broken his covenant. A wife who's just walked away. Friends who turned against you. Dare I say, underlying this is David asked, I don't know why. I don't know why. Why have they done it? You think about a situation I'm going through at the moment uh, 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 and, and, and just wondering why? Why have they changed? It used to be so good and now it's so difficult. Why have they changed? I don't know, but I know that sweetness is gone. Perhaps that's you as well then been through treachery and betrayal and that's David and he's working it through and then he comes in verse 15 let death seal over them let them go down to shoal alive for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart it's as if as I say it's a bit messy you see it's as if he's back where he was in verses uh, verses uh, 9 to 11 with this this longing for evil to be gone even connected in some way with what Ahithophel is done. And then verse 16. Now, I think we almost see David starting to stabilize. He, he, out, out of this situation, he's working it through with God, and it says, but I call to God. The Lord will save me evening and morning and at noon. At my lunch break, I take time to pray then. I utter my complaint. A moan, and he hears my voice. Bring everything to the Lord, even your complaints and your moanings. And then if you've got some more complaints and moanings, bring it to the Lord. He wants to hear them. Of course, you've got to bring your thanksgivings and all the other things that are appropriate, but bring your moanings and your complainings as well. Life's tough, you know, sometimes. That's what I mean. This is the reality of life. Bring them. He, he's our father. And uh, his David, he redeemed, verse 18, he redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage. For many are arrayed against me. Verse 18, God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, Selah, because they do not change and do not fear. I take it he's getting some perspective on here and he's realizing actually the fundamental problem with these people who is against me is they haven't got God in their scene. And that's their problem. But I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to be refreshed in God. But then verse 20, oh, we'll stop there and say, do we know something of that? I'm just stopping and being with God. Be refreshed. I mean, take time, morning, evening, I don't know, in your lunch break, to bring all to the Lord. Your difficulties at work, your struggles, the people who are treating you badly, bring them all to the Lord. And then he's back 
verse 20, with this treachery, this betrayal. Um, his speech, verse 21, he violated his covenant. The commitment that he's made to me, just walk out on it. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. Lots of sweet words, but a twisted heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. As I said, before he can get drawn into any bitterness, he draws it all back in verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. This is one of the great, perhaps some of us have memorized this first, but cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Can, can you feel it? Can, can you feel faith arising with David? Faith is coming up. You know, in the barrenness of all of his situation, inside and outside, he's got himself before God and faith is coming up. Cast your burden on the Lord and he may take care of you. Shout out, everybody. It doesn't say that. It says he will sustain. And he will never permit the righteous to be moved. We, we can... We can almost uh, dress it up quite prettily, can't we? Cast your burden upon the Lord. Is it get uh, you know get a dainty little thing and then just put it on the Lord? Oh, there you are, Lord. It's not like that at all. It's it, it's just it, it it's it's quite aggressive. It's massive. It, the idea is just throw whatever comes at you on the Lord. It's just throw it on the Lord. Get it onto him. Oh, what grief. How does the hymn go? I haven't got it here. Uh, but, uh, you know, it says, Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God. And then he comes, verse 23, and, he, and he, he, he's bringing down the, he's like, the, the actual technical term is the imprecatory prayer. He's calling down judgment properly on men of blood and treachery. These people are people who are guilty of foul acts. Pulling it down. Remember, the Christian wants the removal of evil, either through repentance or forgiveness, or through judgment and condemnation. But I will trust. But I will trust. Enough. I will trust. But have you heard somebody in the background? Are you aware of somebody in the background who went through tumultuous situations, who went through great mental or an emotional ordeal, who was betrayed by one of his closest friends? Perhaps he might have been thinking about Psalm 55, when he was going to Calvary. Think about the tumult. Think about all that he, he went through. We hear some of these verses in all, all of the tumult surrounding him. In Luke's Gospel in chapter 22, listen to them, there's no need to turn... But we'll listen, see some of these verses. Luke chapter 22, uh, we'll see. Now the men were holding Jesus in custody, were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? 
They said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Then further, chapter 23, then the whole company of them and arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, King. And then again, further down, the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt, and mocked him, then arraying him in splendid clothing. He sent him back to Pilate. And then again. They all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Here is our Savior. We read from Hebrews and chapter 4 that in him he was in all points tested like as we are, yet without sin. So we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And that tumult that he uh, went through. And then that heart-wrenching experience in Gethsemane. When he is, when he's just in complete anguish concerning the events of the cross ahead of him verse 44 and being in agony in an agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground and then there is who who's the traitor the one who he washed his feet the one who he cared for the one who he showed such love to, Judas, comes and betrays him with a kiss. Betrayal. Treachery. Judas condemns him. And all the events ensue to his death. And the Lord Jesus has some desire to get out of it all when he says in Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, if, if it is any way, I can get out of this. But not my will. Yours be done. But he's not praying the prayers of condemnation, of judgment and condemnation. From that cross, he's praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His heart of love, that evil will be removed through repentance and forgiveness. The gospel offer uh, that re resounds out of the cross resounds down the ages to us today. And he is the God who forgives those who come to Jesus. So Jesus, our beloved Lord, knows something of Psalm 55. And as he knows Psalm 55, he can be our helper through the journeys that take place in Psalm 55 territory because he knows this way. He knows this way. David knows this way. Many of us know this way. 
So we can speak to brothers and sisters. We've been through the afflictions of tumultuous circumstances, mental illness, treachery and betrayal. And they kept with God. And they can simply say in the end, but I will trust you. And if that's your conclusion, all is well. All is well. I'm going to sing our final hymn. Our final hymn that leads us into the wellness of everything being well is because this dear Lord Jesus who has followed the journey of Psalm 55 is the Lord Jesus who has risen from the dead. Let's sing.